it's actually kind of insane that we let people take out crazy loans, get married, join the military. Yeah. Like all of these. Two guns. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that the age should be raised for to 21 for mm -hmm. all of that, including. And I, I say that as somebody who started selling amateur videos and and camming at 18. I like where my life has ended up. I really have enjoyed my time in the industry and I'm really proud of what I've done. But at the same time, I do think that I was a little bit too young. I started work at a really young age and now I have no other skills, which is a little scary. Out of how things could have gone, I definitely was really lucky and I ended up in a really good place. But I think that people should be encouraged more to get other skills in life before they get into it really scares me that there are so many girls that are still in high school at 18 and they're starting it's just because they can, it's legal. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that should be allowed. Whenever you're that young, you don't really understand the full scope of what you're doing, the full gravity yeah. of the situation. You're a young adult, but a brand new one. And mm -hmm. I feel like it really helps to have some life experience with paying bills and making your own doctor's appointments and paying your rent and, and understanding what adult life is really like before you do something that can permanently alter your trajectory. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am so excited about my guest today. Now, normally, I will give a shout out to my sponsors before I introduce my guest, but my guest actually actively uses and loves the product that is sponsoring this podcast today. So I'm first going to introduce the one and only Kira Noir, who made history in 2023 when she became the first black woman ever to win the Female Performer of the Year at the AVN Awards. Um, she's been a stand-up performer for over a decade in this industry, and I am so excited to have her here. But I'm also very excited for her to tell you about her experience with Tushy, um, the bidet that is incredibly easy to use. So, so Kira, tell me about your experience with Tushy. So I first got a Tushy bidet a couple of years ago mm -hmm. um, because I saw an Asa Kira ad with it. <laughs> and it's amazing. And I'm kind of disgusted with myself for not having one sooner. Um, it's really weird that we don't clean our butts thoroughly after yes. we use the restroom. Uh, it's super easy to install. They have a couple of different types. One of them, you can even connect it to your hot water so you can have warm water coming through. It's the, the little stream nozzle is adjustable so you can have it perfectly pointed at your butthole. And it's honestly, whenever the lockdown started, remember and everyone was panic buying toilet mm -hmm. paper and stuff like that. Right. I was fine because with using a bidet, you use less toilet paper. So it's just, I love it. Please get one. It's clean. It's easy to use. It's really good for you. You're going to be cleaner and healthier and nicer. And it's, you're also going to save some monies. Come on. <laughs> it's, it is amazing. My husband actually bought one for me a while ago, um, though we, we all know it was for him. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I love it as well. And of course, if you want to get 10% off of your entire order, use code Holly at checkout. So you want to go to hellotushy.com with promo code Holly. Um, you know, I mean, Kira Noir said it's amazing and I say it's amazing. So go and buy it. And that was the best <laughs> spot, like natural sponsorship ad I've ever done. And uh, thank you, Kira, for no that. Problem. <laughs> I've bought some for my friends even. I love that thing. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I, Tushy, you need to sponsor her. I don't know what for. Like she's but she's going to she clearly loves your products. So mm. I feel like she deserves some some tushy bidets. <laughs> so anyways, um, so Kira, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you it's for such a pleasure you. to see you. I'm always really happy to be in your presence. You're just like a lovely person. You've got really good energy and um, you're obviously beautiful and really fun to shoot. And it's been a while since you've been on the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot has happened since then. <laughs> so um, I guess let's start off. Do you want to start off talking about your AVN win? Because that was a huge moment for you. Yeah, that was insane. Um, I had been nominated for a female performer of the year uh, a couple of times mm -hmm. before I won. And to be honest, I always just felt like I was hoping to get the nomination. I never expected to win, um, partially because a black woman had never won before, but also because, I mean, the that category is stacked full of amazing women that mm -hmm. I'm really just honored to be listed beside. So I, I never wanted to give myself false hope, basically, and think I was going to win. And I have this thing, every award show, 
I, whoever I'm sitting with, I'll make bets with them with, with whatever categories that I'm in, especially because I want to make sure that if I lose, I'm still looking forward to something else. Mm-hmm. So when they announced my name, um, I was talking to my friend JT, who's a photographer that's worked with a bunch of different companies, but mm-hmm. also yeah, grasses a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we were uh, betting each other on like who was going to win. I said Angela. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I can't remember who he said, but I didn't hear my name get called because I was too busy like whispering with JT next to me. Um, and it wasn't until the people that I was sitting next to on the other side started screaming at me to get up on stage that I realized it was me. <laughs> um, and so that was that was really great. I cried. Um, I I, and, and it's a, a gigantic honor. Did, were you shocked by like, cause I, so I didn't go to that um, award show, but I remember hearing about it and I remember like watching the footage and the standing ovation that you got and like the way that like everybody was so excited about you winning. Like, how did that make you feel? Really, really good. I, I've made my family for the last 10 years. Yeah. So having support from everyone like that, it makes me feel so loved. <laughs> like I, I love the industry. I love the industry and it feels really nice to know that people had that kind of reaction to me winning yeah and then how did it feel to be like the first female black female performer to win that it's it's bittersweet and that's yeah. like the, the best way i can describe it was it kind of like why did it take so long yeah i mean uh, i'm sure and, that was definitely like one of your first thoughts mm-hmm. and it's something where of course i was over the moon about winning and i'm that's it, the biggest accolade of my career mm-hmm. but it's also it comes with an asterisk. Like mm-hmm. I, whenever I talk about it, it's a conversation like this where I was yeah. the first black woman, and it is really sad that it took uh, thirty years for it to happen. Yeah. Um. So I I never want to shy away from the fact that it, it comes with that asterisk of mm-hmm. yes, there are a lot of women that came before me that were also very deserving. Um. And it's great that things are changing for the better, and that more black, brown, trans, gay performers are being treated more equally, but. It just sucks that it's taking this long, you know? Yeah. Like, I'd, um, I I wish I had a better way to describe it, but bittersweet is the best term I can have for it. Is it also, like, a little bit frustrating that when everybody, anyone, everyone brings that up, they bring it up with that asterisk? It can't just be like, hey, congratulations on winning Female Performer of the Year. Just, mm-hmm. like, and then, like, that's the end of it. You know what I mean? It's not frustrating, but it is a little bit sad. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wish that I... I wish that I wasn't the first, if that makes yeah. any sense. It's really amazing. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it makes me a little bit sad. So yeah. uh, this this last year, uh, Ivana Bardar won, and I was super, super happy about that. Mm-hmm. Um, she worked so fucking hard mm-hmm. all year. I, I'm more friends with her boyfriend, Cody Steele, um, and he was telling me about all this like, crazy workout plans that she was doing and crazy diets and how much creative control she had in her showcase and all the different scenes that she was doing. And she was killing it on social media and killing it in her scenes. And she was just in Griselda, this like, mainstream Netflix TV show. So mm-hmm. I, I was hoping that she won. I actually won um, two bets this year because <laughs> I bet against Ricky Greenwood and Ricky Johnson that she would win. Oh, wow. Um, and it was one of those things where I I feel like I also had a really great year. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of me wanted to have a 2 P, and another part of me was like, I don't want to have another year of conversations about this specifically. I want to be happy for my friend and just kind of leave it at that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Um, you also won this year, you won best, was it best tag team? Yeah. For um, um, Gunner, right? Mm-hmm, Machine Gunner. Um, and best leading actress for Machine Gunner. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget about that one. <laughs> the one of you all on your own. <laughs> <laughs> no, both of them, super excited. Those are the ones that I was hoping to get the most. Yeah. Um, with best tag team, that was a really intense scene. I think we talked about it a little bit before. We did. Mm-hmm. So I remember just seeing, I think, first the images of it and you're like, tied up like upside down and like the the light rays coming through the ceiling mm-hmm. with like the, I mean like I know how that was lit and so I'm like look at I'm like oh god that looks so beautiful and like <laughs> with the like a little bit of haze in the air and yeah mm-hmm. it looked amazing it, it makes me extra happy when people who know the technical stuff behind the scenes can look at something that I've done and be like oh yeah that's really good because mm-hmm. it, the image itself is beautiful and then whenever people know the work that goes into doing that yeah it, it's just ah oh, yes I'm like, getting acceptance on all fronts this yeah is <laughs> so tell me about the scene specifically because mm-hmm. i mean it looks like you're tied up mm-hmm. and then you're being like you know you're giving like <laughs> like tied down but you said that you weren't actually tied up it was kind of like a like it was faked a little bit right so we didn't have a professional rigor on set mm-hmm. um we didn't have somebody who was super well versed in 
system that could tie me in a way that we could easily put up and take down. Um, and also for cl- compliance, we couldn't mm-hmm. have me be upset about what was happening in any way. I couldn't mm-hmm. be coerced into what was happening. It wasn't a type of scene where because I was a, a prisoner, I was captured by these guys that were making me f- mm-hmm. I was the one that was like, I want to have f- So yeah. we were doing that. <laughs> yeah, it was like putting you in this kind of empowering role. And it was mm-hmm. funny too, because of course, like having, you know, myself worked for, um, you know, browsers and brands like that for so long. I just knew I'm like, she's going to have, there's going to be some dialogue in here that's <laughs> like, you know, proves that like, she's the one who wants to have like mm-hmm. she initiates because we have to be so careful about that. Oh, yeah. So the me being tied up and being upside down part, uh, because I was the one that was initiating it, I had to hold on to the rope. Then they kind of just loosely wrapped my wrists with it mm-hmm. a couple of times. And then I had to do a pull up and <laughs> wrap my legs around Charles Dara's uh, shoulders mm-hmm. so he could start. Mm-hmm. Out. And then once I was stable on his shoulders, I was able to lean back and be upside down so I could. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so even though I guess I was tied up and yes, they're tag teaming me, it was a, I am doing this now by lifting myself up right. and putting myself in this position, literally. How was that? Was that like really hard? It was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Huh. I, I had to um, fake it a little bit. I, I'm I'm strong, but not super strong. I was actually trying to work out extra before doing this movie because I wanted to have a little extra muscle and yeah. make it believable that yeah. I was a soldier. Yeah. Um, but even then, I, I can't do too many pull-ups. And so I was able to get myself kind of up there. So hard. <laughs> and then they had to pull me up the rest of the way. <laughs> But those guys are great. They're both pros and they're both really strong. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they'll they'll hold you and support you. Mm-hmm. How long were you able to do that position before, like, you had to take a break or did you not? I think we probably did that a total of five-ish minutes. Okay, um, That's, which is a long time. Yeah, but it, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I've been upside down before um, for scenes, mostly for kink.com mm-hmm. and full suspensions. And I know that being... If I was straight up upside down, um, mm-hmm. like feet to the ceiling, I feel like that would be harder. But because I was kind of leaning into it and I was able to move my head freely and it, it didn't feel so bad. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So tell me about the movie in general. Hmm. Um, so it was a digital playground movie directed by Ricky Greenwood. I played Nikki Ransom. And the premise was essentially that my ex-lover, Alex Jones, used to work with me for the US government, for the army, black ops. And he went rogue and turned into a bad guy. And so my team and I had to go to the the seedy jungle area that he was in to go get him and bring him back to the U.S. so he could face justice. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And so everyone in my little crew is fucking each other. And (laughs) I end up fucking a bunch of people along the way. There's a part where I get uh, captured. There's a part where... I'm shooting guns. At one point, I did like a Rambo style two gun screaming and shooting people. <laughs> um, and that was wild because we were using actual guns with uh, fake bullets in it. Mm-hmm. A- and so we had an actual armor on set that was going through gun safety with us, which was really cool. And yeah. he had us for the, the first day we were going through a field and kind of just pointing our guns around. And what he had us do is he taught us the basic safety things of this is what a fake round looks like. You don't want to point your gun at anybody. Um, But then he let us just go ahead and walk the way we felt like we needed to. And he Mm -hmm. started making corrections from there. Mm -hmm. I think that that really helped. Like, I didn't know you weren't supposed to close one eye when you're looking through a scope. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I know. I would have thought the same thing. (laughs) I think there's one picture out of me doing that because we were just snapping some pictures before we started shooting and before he started correcting us. Mm -hmm. And then all the other stuff that we have, like, we're all just, like, looking through it, actually. I've shot guns before, but never anything with a scope. So Mm -hmm. that was fun to learn. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what your experience with guns had been before that. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I was raised in the South, and then after that, I was a, a Midwestern wife. So I'd shot some guns before. <laughs> really? Um, but it was all backwoods, like in the middle of nowhere, Missouri, shooting at beer cans kind right. of stuff. Um, I think I went deer hunting a couple of times, but I never actually shot at any deer. I just mm-hmm. got drunk in a deer stand all day. <laughs> so, but it, like really light recreational yeah. gun usage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've literally like shot a gun, I think maybe once my husband took me shooting mm-hmm. and he handed me the gun, I shot it and I handed it back to him and I was like, I don't ever want to touch that ever again. Really? Yeah, I didn't like it at all. Was it the recoil, the sound? I don't I don't like holding something that um, is so dangerous mm-hmm. and can take someone's life so easily. Mm-hmm. It freaks me out. You should take it that seriously. Yeah, I just I, like mm-hmm. I just really don't like them yeah, at all. I mean sense. like nothing against 
gun owner, my husband's a gun owner, you know, but I'm just like, not for me. Mm-hmm. That stance is always going to be much better than somebody's like, yeah, I'm just going to yeah mm, hold my gun anywhere. Uh, I like shooting guns just for fun, but it's also a very serious thing that you can kill somebody with. So you, you have to yeah. have that level of importance on it so you don't yeah. end up hurting somebody. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely definitely not for me. Mm-hmm. So you said you were a Midwestern wife. Yeah. <laughs> so you got married pretty early, I assume. Yeah, um, I got married at 18. Mm. Um, wasn't one of my better decisions. Mm-hmm. And I left him when I was 20 and got into porn. <laughs> Much better decision. Yeah, yeah. No, it's worked out a lot better for me. <laughs> I mean, marriage lasted two years. Porn career mess lasted 10. Yeah. So. <laughs> Speaking of, like, getting into porn at a young age, you know, there's a lot of talk around thinking that 18 is too young to get into porn. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I agree. And I'm a hypocrite. Because Do you also think it's too young to get married? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's actually kind of insane that we let people take out crazy loans, get married, um, join the military. Yeah. Like all of these. Shoot guns. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I think that the age should be raised for to 21 for mm-hmm. all of that, including porn. And I, I say that as somebody who started selling amateur videos and stripping and camming at 18, mm-hmm. um, where I like where my life has ended up. I really have enjoyed my time in the industry and I'm really proud of what I've done. But at the same time, I do think that I was a little bit too young. And mm. what ended up happening was I, I started sex work at a really young age, and now I have no other skills, which is a little scary. Mm. Um, so out, out of how things could have gone, I definitely was really lucky, and I ended up in a really good place. But I think that people should be encouraged more to get other skills in life before they get into porn. It really scares me that there are so many girls that are still in high school at 18 and they're starting an OnlyFans just because they can. It's legal. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that should be allowed. I think that they should... Whenever you're that young, you don't really understand the full scope of what you're doing, the full gravity of the situation. You're a young adult, but a brand new one. And Mm -hmm. I feel like it really helps to have some life experience with paying bills and making your own doctor's appointments and paying your rent and, and understanding what adult life is really like before you do something that can permanently alter your trajectory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember Alina Lopez said something along those lines and she was just talking about how it's really good to go out and get like a regular nine to five job mm-hmm. where you have to show up on time or you get fired and yeah. you have to like punch in and punch out mm-hmm. and you know, you have like taxes taken out of your check and you know, all those kinds of things that make you kind of like understand what it's like to be in the workforce. Mm-hmm. Because when you come into adult, especially if all you're doing is OnlyFans, like, I mean, the wonderful thing about it is that you get to be your own boss, right? Mm-hmm. Make your own hours and do whatever you want. But then it also like doesn't give you a very good sense of how the world generally works. And right. if you decide to go and work um, in like studio porn, you know, I mean, sometimes girls will like, they'll show up very late and they're like, what's the big you know yeah, what I it's mean? Just porn. Like, yeah. who cares? Like, what's mm-hmm. the big deal? It's like working with other people. People aren't necess- they don't necessarily like understand how that works. Mm-hmm. Now, somebody pointed out to me that part of the reason why there are so many eighteen-year-olds uh, getting into sex work is because the world's not really set up to make a lot of money in normal ways anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, everything's just kind of getting worse and worse. It's really hard for people to find jobs, especially good-paying ones. So before we would raise the porn age, I feel like there are a lot of other things about how our country works that we would have to fix before. Otherwise, you're just going to leave a bunch of people without any way to make money. And I feel like that sucks even more. Yeah. I feel like overall, younger people should just be more protected and everyone should have more access to a living wage and just an actual life to look forward to. Um, some people are getting into porn really young just because they can. And they think mm-hmm. it's fun. They think it's going to be a cool, sexy time. And other people are doing it because they have to. Like, mm-hmm. I started doing sex work when I, at a young age because I needed to pay bills immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried applying to retail stores and fast food places. And I, w- I was kind of dumb because I'd never applied anywhere before. So they were asking me things like, do you have your own method of transportation i'll be like no i'm, I'm just gonna take the bus or a taxi or something and mm-hmm. i didn't realize that, that was a bad thing to say yeah <laughs> um, so nobody wanted to hire me uh, but i still had to pay money like i if you want to get into it i had this whole weird situation where i was living with my sister and some not great people and mm-hmm. that they i they tricked me into thinking that i owed them money mm-hmm. um so i needed to make money fast and that's just what ended up helping me and i think that if it was easier for me to get a normal job and to get a job that not only was good at an entry level but like paid my bills and where Mm -hmm. i could get my own place um then i wouldn't have to have done that yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's it's kind of scary when you think about how back you know in 
the 50s and 60s, you know, you could work a factory job, you could mm-hmm. get a pension, and you could afford to buy a house. Yeah. And you could raise a family of three and have a wife that didn't work, and mm-hmm. you could have a perfectly, like, normal, comfortable life. Yeah. And now that's impossible. Impossible. Like, minimum wage, it was intended to be the minimum amount of money you needed to, ha- like, support a family. Yeah. To, at the very least, support yourself, but support a family. And the way things are now, it's just not the case. If you're working minimum wage, you're living at home or you're living with roommates so you're not going to be able to without government assistance or doing something kind of like porn or yeah. something kind of even shadier um you're you're not going to be able to support yourself or a family and that's i feel like i'm talking in circles now i apologize I'm, i know i have all of these ideas and sometimes i feel like i don't have the right words to express them. i know exactly what you mean. <laughs> oh my god i i do think that the age for porn and for a lot of other things should be raised but in order to do that in a way that doesn't screw over a whole bunch of young adults there are a lot of a lot of other things that need to change first yeah no i agree mm-hmm. All right, uh, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about some sexier topics (laughs) rather than like the decline of American civilization. (laughs) So hang tight. We'll be right back. Let's talk for a moment about something that we all do, but rarely discuss going to the bathroom. Now, what if I told you that there's a way to make that experience cleaner, more comfortable and actually better for the environment? Enter Tushy Bidet, the revolutionary bathroom attachment changing the game one clean butt at a time. Now, my husband bought me this a few years ago, and I can't believe that I ever lived without it. It keeps me feeling so clean. I even have it installed in my studio because, you know, I shoot a lot of people's butts. Tushy Bidet easily attaches to your existing toilet and uses a precise stream of fresh water to clean thoroughly, leaving you feeling shower fresh after every use. Switching to Hello Tushy Bidet protects the most delicate skin on your body by using a targeted stream of fresh water, giving you a chemical-free way to get clean. But it's not just about comfort, it's also about sustainability. You're cutting down on toilet paper use, saving trees, and reducing waste. It's a small change in your routine with a big impact on the planet. Installation is a breeze. In minutes, you'll transform your bathroom experience. Every Hello Toshi Bidet comes with a 30-day hassle-free return and a 12-month warranty. So why stick to the old way when you can upgrade to a cleaner, greener, and more luxurious bathroom routine with Toshi Bidet? Over 3 million butts love Toshi. Get 10% off Toshi with the code HOLLY at hellotoshi.com. That's 10% off with code HOLLY at hellotoshi.com. All right, everybody, we are back. So Kira, you are a very well-rounded performer that does gonzo scenes, features, and of course, OnlyFans content. Um, What keeps you coming back to filming features when there are so many, quote, easier ways to make money in the industry? I do really love acting. Um, I love having the fancier videos to show people. I mean, I just won another award for, I've Mm -hmm. won four total awards for acting now, actually. I I won uh, Best Supporting Actress three years in a row. And then my first leading role, I won uh, Best Leading Actress for AVN. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, and I think that the gonzo scenes are more fun to shoot in the moment because mm-hmm. you just show up and put on a slutty outfit and you can interact with the cameraman and yeah, <laughs> all yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, but the storyline videos, um, there's a lot of work that goes into like how artistic everything looks, how beautiful everything looks. And you get to learn lines and kind of show off your acting skills. And that's really fun. It's a lot longer. It's a lot more oh frustrating. God, future days are so long. Oh, yeah. But then at the end, you get to look at this amazing product. And yeah. You're like, wow, I was a part of that. It's exciting to see, like, the final edited product. Generally, like, if I shoot a gonzo scene, I don't really care. You'll <laughs> see it in the end. But if I shoot a feature, like, and of course, we're the ones who do the opposite of probably what most of the fans do, mm-hmm. where we fast forward through the sex part. Yeah. We only watch the dialogue. <laughs> right. No, I know how the sex looks. Show me yeah, how like, I looked when I was giving yeah, my lines. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so uh, you've also said that you think that girls who do OnlyFans should still be considered porn stars. I know there's yes. been a lot of like chatter about that and creators versus porn stars. Mm-hmm. Um, why do you think there is a divide in opinion about OnlyFans performers' place in the industry? So I have this theory. It does not apply to everybody, but it's something that I've noticed happening a lot Mm. where whenever you have a girl that's been in the industry for a while on the studio side, um, 
things have gotten a lot better, but pretty recently things were pretty awful in terms of like uh, lines being blurred and people not knowing if they had to fuck the director in order to get mm -hmm. work and you would show up to set not knowing who your scene partner is or even what you're doing sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, like that used to be really, really common. And so I think that a lot of people have kind of comforted themselves by telling themselves that because they went through all of those awful things, the bad agents, the shitty model houses, and being told to do stuff that you're not comfortable with doing on set, and going to conventions, and your mm -hmm. feet bleeding because you're like standing on your yeah. heels all day, and like all that kind of stuff. You go through all of that, and now you have earned the title of porn star. Yeah. So seeing a girl who is making videos in her bedroom, on her phone, with her boyfriend, total comfort, everything exactly the way she wants, everything is edited perfectly to her standards. She owns all the content. Owns all the content. Yeah. is making all of the money off of it. And then she's like, yeah, I'm a porn star. It, it pisses some of them off because they're like, you didn't go through all of the work that I went through mm -hmm. in order to achieve that title. And in my opinion, it's just, if you do porn and you star in that porno, you are a porn star. It doesn't mean that everyone is a gigantic celebrity. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that saying that somebody like Miss Be Nasty or Kazumi like, aren't porn stars because they haven't done mainstream scenes or Kazumi has now, but there are people that were saying like, oh, Kazumi can't call herself a porn yeah. star. She just does OnlyFans. That's silly. If somebody does porn, in my mind, they're a porn star. Um, I think that it's kind of a weird topic and I hope that there are less people that think that you have to go through those things in order to be a porn star. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, if bad things happen to, to you, the, the course of like a bunch of bad things happened to me when I first started, um, I, I don't think that that gave me the title of porn star mm -hmm. um and we should just all be nicer to each other i think yeah. a whore is a whore is a whore um the porn girls aren't better than the only fans girls and they're not better than the cam girls and they're not better than the escorts and they're not better than the strippers and like people all do this infighting of oh mm -hmm. i'm not as bad as that other sex worker because mm -hmm. i'm x y and z and yeah we call it the hierarchy yeah, yeah. And, and i've been i've done amateur porn i've done camming i've been a hooker like just like a hundred dollars you can do whatever you want to me i've been a high-end escort where it's like, insane amount of money just to have dinner with me. I have done studio porn. I have been a sugar baby, I've been a stripper, like all of the different types of sex work. And they're all really fucking similar. Mm. Um, you can be a an escort and people are gonna wanna talk to you all day. You can be a sugar baby and somebody's just gonna like want you to show up and fuck. You can be a porn girl and be treated like a fucking princess on set. You can be an OnlyFans girl and just like, have really high end, high production value videos. I feel like a lot of times when people are like, oh, well, I'm different from the other person because they don't do what I do. It's like, they're probably also doing what you do. Like mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's all very interconnected and the outside world kind of sees us as all the same. Like you're not gonna be treated better than another sex worker just because like, oh, well, I I talk to my clients, so I'm better. That's, that's just silly. <laughs> I was gonna say like, cause all of them experience the same stigma yes. right around mm -hmm. sex work mm -hmm. so we're all going to be stronger if we stick together yeah and all the infighting of like oh you can't use that title or oh i'm better than you because of whatever it's just serving the outside world being mean to us like it's mm -hmm. not helping you it's not making you any higher in your position in the world yeah um, it's not protecting you from any sort of social stigma or any sort of violence that comes your way because you're a sex worker it only hurts our community and mm -hmm. helps people who want to hurt us yeah it's crazy though like it has changed so much in the last few years i mean i remember when i first started 25 years ago <laughs> um that there was it was a very normal and accepted thing for porn stars to like look down on escorts yeah i mean and and it would be very common that if a girl escorted on the side and she was paired with another partner that if that other girl found out she would not work with her because she escorted mm -hmm. and it was like well i'm a porn star but she's a hooker and i'm not going right. there you know and it's like mm -hmm. well we all do the same testing um but yeah i mean and, and look people will sometimes say that it's about like safety and i get that mm -hmm. and and sure and like whatever you want to whatever works for you and your sense of safety about your own body is 100 yeah. percent your decision but there was definitely an element of like, I'm better than you because I'm a porn star and you're a hooker. Right. 
Um, and when it comes to testing and, and those kind of standards, I've heard that argument before of, oh, well, you don't know if they're fucking their clients with a condom or not. And it's like, you don't know if the girl who's not escorting is fucking guys on Tinder or not. Yeah. You, you don't know what they're getting up to. They can be going to sex parties. They could be like flying to Berlin and getting fucked in like the sex clubs there and like, yeah. coming back and doing a scene with you the next week. Like we, there's a certain level of risk because we can't sit there and be with our scene partners throughout the whole week to make yeah. sure that they're not testing, sorry, not fucking anybody who's untested. Um, and I feel like if you need to put certain boundaries in place to make yourself feel safer, then you should absolutely be allowed to do that. But we should be thinking critically about why we feel certain ways about certain things. Yeah. And I definitely think that any opinion that starts with, I am better than this other person because of this arbitrary thing that I decided is different about the way I do things, then mm-hmm. that's, that's a little silly. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had some very bad experiences when you started. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate like on any of those? Yeah. Um, So when I was first uh, doing sexy stuff for money, Mm -hmm. um, I kind of got groomed. I didn't know that that's what it was called back Mm -hmm. then Uh, because people weren't really talking about it the way they talk about it now. Yeah. Um, But I met my husband at the time back then when um, I was 15 and he was 25. Ooh. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And I met him because my older sister... Um, was married to his best friend Mm -hmm. and they told her that they wanted to do inappropriate things with teenage girls instead of being like oh fuck you I'm going to divorce you now and never talk to either one of you again um she was like oh I know one and introduced them to me and told me but my sister and I we fought our whole lives Mm -hmm. Uh, we were never close so when she came to me and said that she was really sorry about how she treated me when we were growing up and she wanted to be family with me and be close with me and have a connection with me. I was so overjoyed. And it came with like this extra thing of, oh, and this is my family too. So if you're family with me, you're family with them, right? Mm -hmm. And we can all be family. And I kind of felt like I had to. Um, And then when I moved out, um, I when I was 17, I actually went and moved in with her. And my first night there, she was like, so um, you're with Tommy, the guy that I ended up marrying. And he also lives here and he owes me money. And since you're going to be his wife, um, his debts are your debts. And now you owe me money. So how are you going to pay all of the rent that he hasn't been paying for the last couple of months? And that's when I had to come up with money really fast. Oh, my God. Um, They're like the IRS. It was. uh, And and now when people talk about um, grooming and trafficking and and what like using terms for things that was happening to me, I just didn't have a, a term for it. Um, it's really weird, <laughs> um, but that was that was the very, very beginning of where I started stripping and camming and doing amateur videos. Um, and then when I finally realized that my husband was probably kind of a weird guy, it, it took me a while. Yeah. But I realized how weird that situation was and how yeah. fucked up our beginning was and ended up leaving him. Um, and by then, I had met a porn agent. I, at first, I was just going to go to California and make some money to move out of the place that I had with him. And mm-hmm. I was fully intending on going to California, shooting a couple of videos, making some money, going back to St. Louis mm-hmm. and starting over. But then I, I really loved it. I loved California. I didn't want to leave. So I went back and forth a couple of times. Um, and I was with an agency that was nothing like Spiegler. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, I got the things where I didn't know what I was doing half the time when yeah. I was going to go to set. There are a couple of times they sent me um, to locations where they said the uh, porn scene was going to be happening, but it ended up being an escort gig. Mm, um, it's like one guy in a motel room with yeah, like a camera maybe that yeah. doesn't film in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't a great situation either, but I was able to make enough to fully move to California. And shortly after I moved to California, I also made enough money to um, buy my way out of my first contract. And my first agent, he told me that he was going to give me Spiegler's number. And at first I thought it was another lie. I thought it was going to like call this dude and he was going to tell me to meet him in a hotel room. He was going to be like, oh yeah, I'm totally Spiegler. Suck my dick and all you get to be a super- <laughs> I was fully expecting that to happen. Wow, that's <laughs> terrible that that was like what you thought was going to transpire based on your experience. God. But I had this thing where it's like, hey, as long as he pays me, like I, I can keep making money and I'll figure it out. Um, but then it actually ended up being Spiegler. So, like, <laughs> and surprise, surprise, he didn't ask you to suck his dick. No, not at all. Um, I I, got I feel hit. like if you offered to suck Spiegler's dick, he'd be like, absolutely not. He got mad at me. So <laughs> did you do that? Did you do that accidentally? 
<laughs> so I, I had him saved in my phone as daddy because I was 20 and that was hilarious to me at the time. <laughs> no, 21, sorry. And I also was fucking this guy and I also saved him in my phone as daddy. Uh-huh. And there was one day I was talking to this girl and she said that she wanted to fuck me and the guy that I was fucking. And so I started sending a text message. It was like, hey, I just saw Charlotte and she really wants to fuck both of us. So when do you want to set that up? And also, do you want me to come over right now because I'm feeling horny? And, blah, blah, blah. and I sent it. And as soon as I sent the sent button i realized i sent it to the wrong daddy oh <laughs> like God. three seconds after that he called me screaming at me <laughs> and he was like what the fuck is wrong with you who the fuck is strong why the fuck would you think i would want to do that what is why why would you even and he was just so upset and i was like no 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 no! sent you to the wrong person i'm so sorry it wasn't meant for you <laughs> Um, and so I like to tell people that story because everyone likes to start rumors about yeah. what it takes to be a Spiegler girl and, yeah. and what was really happening behind the scenes. And I've heard that rumor before of like, oh, you you have to fuck Spiegler. If you want to. Yeah. That's not true. Um, not only is it not true, but when he thought I was propositioning him, he was offended that I would even <laughs> think that he would want that. <laughs> I got to say like, yeah, because I mean, look, like. We love Spiegler, but he has a look about him that I think people expect porn agents to look like. And mm-hmm. he's like the first person who will say that. Mm-hmm. Um, but he is like one of the most like honorable agents. Like he is the one agent like who's definitely not going to try to fuck you. Mm-hmm. And like anybody who knows him like knows that. Yeah. And it's um it's just ironic because people think the opposite of that, <laughs> you know? So mm-hmm. that's really funny. That's such a good story. Oh, my God. I love it. I can't wait to when I see him next, I'm going to tell them that you told me that story. <laughs> That's so good. Um, so uh, you said that you liked watching gangbangs until you actually started filming them. Mm-hmm. Um, so how did being on set take away some of that gangbang magic for you? So in porn, everything is, is perfectly edited. And whenever you're watching the finished product, it can often look like people are just naturally falling into different positions. Mm-hmm. They're just so in sync and they know, oh, I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna do that. And everything looks perfect. Everything's perfectly clean, all that good stuff. Um, in reality, especially for something that has a lot of people in it, there's gonna be a lot of cuts. People are gonna to wanna to need water or lube, or sometimes they'll try to go into a position and then it doesn't really work. And so you have to cut and start over and like do the mm-hmm. transition again to something else after having a little discussion about what you're going to do. Yeah. And whenever I was first watching gangbang porn, I thought it was just a bunch of really fucking horny guys and all of them are so fucking horny that they all need to fuck the same girl all at the same time. Yeah. And then I actually did it and it's like, oh no, everyone is struggling to keep going. <laughs> 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 it's, 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 oh, like, yep. I, yeah. And sometimes there's that one guy that like just can't do it and mm-hmm. he keeps like kind of fading to the back and right. like trying to get back up and then trying to come back in mm-hmm. and then he loses again and he slowly backs back out again. Right. And I feel like the best gangbangs have to be at swinger parties where there's enough guys, enough tested people and everyone's comfortable with each other where people mm-hmm. can just kind of fade in and out whenever mm-hmm. they want to. Mm-hmm. Um, but for porn, whenever somebody needs a break, sometimes we all have to stop or sometimes, you know, the camera's out of memory so you have to change cards and just or it's so hot and everyone's overheating and yeah. you know, they're not going to be able to come anytime soon so you need to stop so you can turn the ac on because you can't have that running during the video right that would sound weird nobody wants that yeah so it's just like the amount of warehouse gangbangs i've done oh. where in the summer when we can't have the ac oh on. god no <laughs> not like the, the warehouses in the <laughs> summer so it looks cool as fuck um, but now that I know all the work that goes into making it look like that, yeah, I think that if I would, if I were to have a gangbang in real life, I wouldn't do a, a planned thing where it's like only these five people. I would want like ten to fifteen guys. That way, there can be a constant rotation. So if anyone is not feeling it that day, or needs to take a break, or needs to get some water, a snack, mm-hmm. or whatever, it's just like a constant flow of people instead of having to stop because we need five at all times. Yeah, in perfect silence and <laughs> just like yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Have you, though, I have to say, like, I, I've actually, so I've been really lucky. I've, I've shot three gangbangs in my life. Mm-hmm. One of them was for Joanna Angel, and that was only stills. Mm-hmm. Uh, Quasar did the the video, and I left before then, so I don't know how it went, but I'm sure it was fine. Um, one was for Riley Reed, and it, I actually, all of them were great because the girl themselves hired me for it. Mm-hmm. So one was Riley Reed, and the other one was Lisa Ann. And those actually all went really well. Um, but I think so much of it has to do with the guys yes. that you hire. It's like not even whether or not the girl likes the guys. It's that the guys like each other. Mm-hmm. And if they 
can kind of have that symbiotic relationship. That's mm-hmm. why, like, so many gangbangs that you see have the same guys. Right, because they all work well together. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. And um, I have to say, like, it all went pr- pretty well. One of them had one guy that sort of struggled, mm-hmm. um, but he would kind of disappear out of, out of the shot. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, both they were all, like, pretty good. And, and I always – I'm always really impressed – by the way that the guys are able to talk to each other yeah. in a non-verbal way. And if you pull back and you watch a gangbang, like, cause normally you crop in, you crop the guy's faces out. But if you're like sitting back and watching it, you see the guys like looking at like, okay, right, you know, <laughs> like, they could switch and like, mm-hmm. you know, they're like looking around for the next guy. Like, okay, he's next. I gotta like, how many, where am I gonna go? Like, mm-hmm. it's like kind of amazing. It's like this, this, this dance and the choreography is like, it's kind of incredible. I dated a guy for two years partially because I met him during a gangbang mm-hmm. and he was so sweet and the way he was communicating with other guys I thought was adorable. There was one part where I was um, I was in Cowgirl. We were on this couch. And so I was I had the guy that I was on Cowgirl the straddling uh, in my pussy. There was somebody behind me in my ass. I had a hand here and here on dicks. And then the guy that I ended up dating um, was behind the couch uh, fucking my face. And so because my hands are occupied and I can't mm-hmm. really move too much, um, he was fucking my face in a river of spit just sort of going down and it started plopping down on the guy that I was riding. Uh-huh. And the dude whose dick I was sucking just looked down and he was like, I'm sorry. I like, just trying, <laughs> trying to apologize, but also not make too much noise. Oh my god, and you're so I, considerate! Right, I thought that was so sweet. I literally like fell in love with him after that. Um, so yeah, the communication between guys oh during a gangbang is—it's a, a real brotherhood thing. I love that. God, what, how did so how did you two meet? Well, we were having a gangbang, and mm-hmm. he was just so nice to the other guys in the gangbang yeah. that like I knew he was the one for me. Right, and, like one of the other guys was struggling in it, and every time he was noticing the little struggle he was like hey and just like took his place yeah yeah. you know i mean to be fair like that is a high stress situation Mm -hmm. and to see you know you can always see like what someone's really like when they perform how they perform in a high stress situation and like this is like a great example of like good character yeah yeah you have camaraderie you know good teamwork (laughs) yeah (laughs) so is there a gangbang that you've done that like did work really well where mm-hmm. there was like not a lot of breaks and it really did flow. Yeah. Um, uh, the last one that I did for Brazzers, um, it was really cute. It was called Drowning Cock, My Love. <laughs> um, and there was like a little story attached to it where I was dating Alex Jones again. And he uh, organized a gangbang for me. And that was really good. I did double anal. Um, mm-hmm. And that one's a, a hard one for me to do. So yeah. the fact that I had guys that we're comfortable with doing it and we're all just kind of flowing in and out. Um, Hollywood Cash, he was in it. He's one of my favorite new guys. I'm so happy that he won um, Best Male Newcomer for mm-hmm. ABN this year. But yeah, just having him be a part of it and seeing how well he was flowing with everything. Um, I think that it was Mick Blue, Dan Damage, um, Lucas Frost, Alex Jones, and why am I forgetting? Uh, Hollywood, yeah. Um, so yeah, it was really, really good group of guys that were all comfortable with each other. And so we did have to cut a couple of times just to figure out which positions we're going in and like mm-hmm. who's going to jump into the double anal next and all that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Mo- for the most part, it flowed pretty well. How how did the double anal was that wasn't your first time doing double oh, anal? No. How like so you said that that's hard for you. Why is that hard for you? Besides the fact that you have two dicks in your <laughs> ass, is there any other thing besides that that makes it hard? Yeah, it's it's just scary. Mm-hmm. I think that with anal, for me at least, a lot of it's mental. Mm-hmm. If you get used to the sensation and you know that nothing bad is going to happen, then you can relax and just go into it. When you say bad is going to happen, do you mean like going to poop? No, I'm going to okay. tear. Okay. I, I cheat. I use Imodium. So mm-hmm. um, for people who don't know, uh, Imodium <laughs> is an over-the-counter medicine that is meant to um, kind of solidify anything inside of you to make sure that you're not having anything runny come out. Um, and if you're not already experiencing anything runny and you just take it when you're already normal, it kind of stops you up. So I use that a lot whenever I'm doing anal scenes just mm-hmm. to make sure everything's clean. So I'm usually not worried about that. Yeah. I'm worried more about is tearing. Right. Um, Have I've you ha- ever had that happen? Yes. Um, one of the worst game bang I've ever done, I it was in another, it was in Europe and Prague. Um, so there's only one other person on set that spoke English and he wasn't, like English wasn't his first language. It wasn't crazy fluent. And what they wanted to do is do a um, girl-girl fisting scene first and then do a, uh, like, double gangbang, like me and the other girl with a bunch of guys um, uh-huh. with double anal in it. And so when I got to set, it was just not what I was used to um, in terms of 
shooting standards. Mm. I'm used to people like coming up and being like, so what kind of loop do you prefer? And like, do you mm-hmm. need extra time to like, set yourself up and get mm-hmm. yourself ready and all that kind of stuff. But instead, it's like, as soon as I got on set, they were like, okay, we're ready to go. And I was like, okay, where's the lube? And they're like, what, you need lube? We have Vaseline if you need it. And Vaseline? Yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. And so the other girl that I was shooting with um, didn't speak English, but she held up a little tube when I was trying to ask about lube. And I was like, oh, okay, great. She brought lube, awesome, that's great. And once we actually started the scene um, and she was fisting me, that's when I realized that it was numbing cream, which is terrible to use for anal scenes, especially extreme anal scenes, because you want to be able to feel what is happening to your body. You want to be able to feel fully if something is painful, if something is tearing, if something is like uh, burning. So whenever you use numbing cream, people think like, oh, it's going to be great because it's not going to hurt. I can just keep going. But then if you get a tear, you You will keep going and keep making it worse. So I got a tear during that uh, fisting scene. I couldn't feel it at the time, but by the time we started the gangbang, the numbing cream was wearing off and I still had to do double anal. (laughs) And that was not fun at all. Um, So... Yeah, there's. I've had some highs and lows with King wow. and so now I'm just terrified of tearing again. So yeah. with double anal, it's it's always that fear in the back of my mind. I think I have to do deep breathing. And uh, for this one, I, I just warned all of the guys up front, like before we do the double anal, I want to cut. I want to slowly, without having to think about dirty talking or camera yeah. angles or anything, and doing deep breathing and relaxing fully, like get you in there. And mm-hmm. it's kind of a training exercise for my brain more yeah. than my anus. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, your anus is a muscle, right? Yeah. So a lot of it does have to do with your mindset. Exactly. So I just have to do it slowly at first. Mm-hmm. So it's like, hey, brain, everything's cool. You don't have to freak out, relax, everything's flowing. And then once I can experience it without the stress of it being on camera, then I could turn the cameras back on and be like, yeah, shove it in. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So wait, did you tear in your anus then with the numbing cream? Mm-hmm. So was she fisting your butt? Yeah. Damn, I, I can't do fisting or any extreme stuff in my pussy. It just, it's uncomfortable. Anal is fun. It feels good to mm-hmm. me. But I've tried, uh, I tried double a- uh, vaginal once off camera with two people that I cared about, cared about me and it was mm-hmm. very relaxed uh, and still, didn't, yeah. it's just not my thing. I don't want to do it on camera because I don't think that I could yeah. Pretend to like it. Yeah. Damn. Shit. <laughs> That's crazy. I can't believe there wasn't any lube there. It, they thought Vaseline was enough. It was just, just crazy. Not every European set is like that, but that particular one was. And yeah. I'm not shooting with that director ever again. Yeah. I have I used to shoot in uh, Prague like every year, mm. um, but I always brought lube. Mm. I just remember the one thing they did, they didn't douche. They just uh, used a shower wand. I'm scared of those. I, I'm scared of putting too much water in myself accidentally. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. That was just like, I was like, look, I mean, you know your body, like do whatever yeah. you want. But yeah, it was, it, there was definitely like differences, mm-hmm. which was, which was interesting. Um, so what defines who you are as a person outside of your work? Hmm. I think that right now I'm still trying to figure that out mm. um, because porn has been such a big part of my life for a third of my life. I, it's kind of hard to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> but right now I'm focusing a lot more on uh, relationships, both platonic and romantic. I have a dog who I love. Um, his name is Bubba and he's the sweetest little chihuahua poodle ever. Mm. Um, and I've also been working out a lot more, mm-hmm. not so much lately. All the convention stuff took a lot out of me. So yeah. I have kind of been slacking on my gym game lately. Yeah. But I, I started working out really hard and really focusing on eating enough protein and lifting really heavy and, and got kind of swollen. My butt got a lot bigger, which is cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's been really fun. It, like just kind of celebrating my body and being alive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, because who knows? I don't, not to be like morbid, <laughs> but like there's been a lot of people that have died lately, mm-hmm. like in the industry and also like in my own personal life. and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just reminds you of, like, we don't know how long we are here. Yeah. And, like, what what does matter in life? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, There's a lot of stuff we take for granted. A like, lot of being stuff. able to walk around, being yeah. able to lift up heavy things, being able to speak to people, being able to see, being able to eat and drink good yeah. food, safe food, safe water. Yeah. Like, all of that. It's stuff that a lot of people in the world, and even just in this country, don't have. Yeah. So I try to think about that. I don't want to be too sad and like just kind of be pessimistic all the time, mm-hmm. but I do want to be grateful for the yeah. things that I have. I think gratitude's definitely like a, a key to happiness for sure. Mm-hmm. What do you think is a key to happiness? Ooh. If I told you, I, 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 I wish. <laughs> I wish I could tell you. Um, that's. I don't think that there's such thing as happily ever after. I, mm-hmm. I think that to be alive, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be 
disagreements with other people and things are going to go perfectly all the time and things would be boring if mm-hmm. we got everything we wanted all of the time 100 have you heard about the um the rat utopia experiment the what Okay, so sorry for going off on this weird tangent. No, I love tangents. <laughs> but there was um, this experiment, I, I want to say it was a couple decades ago, where the premise was like, if people got everything they wanted all the time, would that make us happier or would, would things get worse? Um, and so they got a bunch of rats and they put them in this environment where there's plenty of space, plenty of food, plenty of water, um, equal amount of females to males. So everyone had a mating partner potentially and, and just kind of let them live to see what would happen and they went fucking insane um the behaviors of those rats they ended up getting really aggressive some of the males um even though there was plenty of food they still fought over food the mothers wouldn't where they weren't taking care of their babies um (laughs) this i don't think this is like necessarily a bad thing but a lot of the male rats ended up being gay (laughs) 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 where they they stopped trying to mate and they just started offering themselves to the most aggressive males um and then when they tried taking those rats out of that experiment and they tried um putting them back in with rats that hadn't been through any of that stuff they were never able to resume um normal rat behavior again they were just like permanently fucked up and so the idea behind that study is that if we got everything we wanted all of the time we would go insane yeah um so i don't think that there really should be a, a key to happiness because maybe being alive is taking the good with the bad yeah but happiness could also be existing with bad things happening to you because it's a, it's a matter of perception right yeah um it's interesting that you brought that up because i'm spacing on his name right now but there is an author who wrote um uh, he's written a bunch of books. He's like actually like one of those authors who looks at like the positive side of things. So, you know, if you're feeling a little bit disillusioned about the future of the world, um, it's kind of a nice, a nice soft read. But um, he talked about how people were, were, there were lower rates of like suicide and depression back in times and in countries that were experiencing really trying times like Mm. war and like famine and like all these like not great things because what it does is it brings people together yeah and that sense of community and that sense of purpose is what people need Mm -hmm. and makes people happy essentially Mm -hmm. you know and it and i guess it doesn't necessarily have to be like war and famine but you know i mean we grew up in an environment we not you and I, but people, right? <laughs> Started in an environment where like you had to work really hard to get the things that you wanted right mm-hmm. before we had civilization, electricity and the fucking internet and all this stuff. And now like everything's so easy and comes to you so easily. It's almost like we create our own problems because mm-hmm. like we need a purpose and we need like some kind of battle to fight. So it's kind of like the same idea. Yeah. No, and I think that you definitely don't need to go through bad things in order to be happy. But what it ends up doing is forcing you to be more grateful for the things that you do have. Yes. Um, and whenever you have everything, like you, you think about mega rich people who are just complain about having to sit in their mansions all day. It's like they're not grateful for half the stuff that they mm-hmm. have because for them it's a given that they have those things. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd like to not get to that point. <laughs> um, I, I would like to have a lot of money and I would like to yeah. have a lot of comforts in life. But in order to like myself as a person i want to also take time out of every day to be happy that i have a functioning body and friends who love me and i live in a relatively safe area and all those things yeah yeah it's sometimes it's hard for us to remember those things but it's good that like you actively think about that because you're right a lot of people do take things for granted and Mm -hmm. they're generally like find themselves discontent but i think like a sense of purpose is ultimately what a lot of people find brings mm-hmm. like them a sense of joy and whatever that purpose is for you. Yeah. You That's know? why it's hard to answer the question of um, what defines me outside of porn. Because that is a huge part of how I define myself. I mm-hmm. like that I've been a part of the porn industry changing. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the fact that I'm a part of this industry that I think is really fucking interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm so proud of that, that I've kind of forgotten to do stuff outside of porn. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, there's there's a lot to do in porn, you know, mm-hmm. and there and there is. So it's interesting, actually, because we just talked about like, you know, um, <clears throat> challenges creating like a sense of community. And I think that that's like kind of how it works for the adult industry. Mm-hmm. Right. Because there's so much stigma against people in the adult industry and against sex work. And, you know, there's so many people out there. I mean, all you got to do is go on my YouTube channel and read the fucking comments <laughs> under a lot of my interviews. Um, 
and people just like generally have such poor opinions about people in the adult industry and about porn in general. And so it's kind of like it creates a sense of community because it almost there's almost like this us against the world sort of mentality mm -hmm. um, where people are like, no, we're not this. We're we're all like, yes, all of us have issues, but who fucking doesn't? Right. You know, and it like brings I feel like it brings the people together as a community. And that wouldn't happen if it wasn't for the stigma um, that the adult community faces outside of its own little bubble. It's mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've been writing scripts based on your life and your love life, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the stories um, that you have turned into films? And is it therapeutic to like infuse your story into your work? Oh, yeah. Um, so I actually don't want to like specifically say which uh, pornos I had like pulled things from my own life from because I like it to be like a, a little personal thing. Understood. But something that I love is that you can kind of porno logic anything that's happened to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> love porno logic. Yeah. Porno magic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there have been times where I, I take like a theme. Sometimes it's been um, something bad that happened to me that I turn into a good story mm -hmm. or I kind of get to relive something good that happened to me in a super sexy way. Mm -hmm. um, and it is really therapeutic. And I, I, whenever people talk about um, sex work being empowering, I, I think that a lot of people get it wrong. It's not inherently empowering, mm -hmm. um, but it can be. It can be very empowering to think about times where you felt like you were out of control sexually and then be able to have a, a sexual experience where you're completely in control. Mm -hmm. um, like a lot of kink scenes, people will see a girl getting tied up and suspended upside down and hit with cattle prods and think like, oh, she's being degraded because mm -hmm. she's having all these horrible things happen to her. And they don't know that like, I specifically asked for all of those things. Like mm -hmm. I, I got to sit down with somebody with a list of things that I did and did not want to happen to me. And I was able to ask like, oh, I want to experiment with that. Or I really like that. And I want that to happen to me. And it's it does feel empowering for those specific moments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel like, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there. <laughs> no, I think I, I've talked to quite a few performers who have said that they came into the adult industry with like some kind of trauma around sex um, and that they were able to take that, like heal that trauma through taking their power back through sexual experiences. And yeah. of course, this is not the case for everybody. For some right. people, it makes it worse for them. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's important to recognize that like, it depends on where you're at and it's yeah. different for everyone. You know, people have this fantasy of uh, a girl with daddy issues just mm -hmm. getting super horny all the time. And mm -hmm. like, it's this magical thing that happens whenever you're mistreated. Yeah. Um, but I, I think what's actually happening is that it, hypersexuality as a trauma response is just wanting to have an experience that you're in control of instead of your only sexual experiences or your mm -hmm. most significant sexual experiences being these bad things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not always the best way. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely went through a phase where I was just, I wasn't really caring about my health or anybody else's health and that was not great. Um, but I think that I, I can still be considered pretty hypersexual now and <laughs> I'm doing it in a safe and healthy way. Um, and now I can say that my top most significant sexual experiences have been the ones where I've been in control, I had a good time, I got paid, I continue to get paid from it. Some of them are the ones that the videos I own. Um, yeah. So that's, I think that's really good. And the nice thing is too, is that often when you're working in the adult industry for a while, you know, we just talked about community, like everybody knows each other, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of the people that you work with, like you've worked with before. Mm -hmm. So you can have these experiences with people that you know and you trust. Yeah. Like when guys hear that a girl has done 500 porn scenes, they're thinking to themselves like, oh, she's fucked 500 guys. No, we're fucking like the same 15 dudes. Yeah. <laughs> like over the course 100%. of years. Yep. It's like the, the, there's a, for girls, it's really easy to get into porn and it's mm -hmm. really hard to keep it going, like have longevity in the industry. Mm -hmm. and I feel like for guys, it's the opposite. It's really hard to get in and like get yeah. people to trust you enough to get on a porn set and be fucking Riley Reed. Yeah. Um, but then once you can prove you can do it, they're gonna wanna use you all of the time. Oh, yeah. Cause it is a really difficult job that most men can't do. Yeah. So it, you, it's not 500 dudes in porn or like everybody gets a shot at their favorite porn star. It's like the same little group that all the directors and all the producers know are solid. So they and just use you all, all, all the time. totally booked. Mm -hmm. They're like all, you have to book them like way ahead of the girls mm -hmm. and if a guy cancels like so when choice. a girl cancels you can almost always find a replacement if a guy cancels you're like fucked mm -hmm. like you're not gonna it's very unlikely that you'll be able to find somebody else who can come in and fill in for you yeah so 
one question that I get a lot, and you probably get this too, is from guys asking about like, how can I get into the porn industry and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So for you as a performer, what are the qualities in a male performer that you look for that like is somebody that you want to work with again? Um, I'm going to bring him up again because I think he's awesome. Hollywood Cash kind of embodies this mm-hmm. where uh, you need to be able to, one, physically do the job, which yeah. I know sounds great when you're thinking about the fantasy of it, but it's really physically demanding. When um, you're working in a warehouse in the summer with no air conditioning, yeah. <laughs> that's um, your test. Right, because your first scene might not be your your favorite porn star and your favorite situation and being able or to Or she may exactly. not like you. She may not like you. Yeah. Um, you you're going to have a room full of people who are all staring expectantly at you, waiting for you to get your dick hard, and then waiting for you to come in a timely manner. Um, yeah. And from positions that aren't going to be catered to what feels best to you. It's going to be about what looks best on camera. And sometimes things just flow really beautifully and those two can be one and the same. More often than not, you're going to have to be fucking at an angle. You're going to be doing positions that aren't the most comfortable and you need to be able to stay hard and eventually come throughout all of that. So the the actual job itself is a lot more physically and mentally demanding than I think a lot of guys realize. And then past that, you have to be able to put your ego aside in a lot of situations. If your dick isn't working, the one of the worst things a guy can do on set is pretend like it's not happening or get mad at the girl or try to put the blame on somebody else. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to just say, hey, things aren't working. I need a second to get some water. I need a second to calm down. Let me look at something on my phone like or or ask your co-star politely, like, can you tug on my balls a little bit? Or Or worst case scenario, just mm -hmm. call it. Or just call it. Be like, this isn't happening Exactly. I've seen there... There are a lot of guys who end up having a bad day on set. Bodies are weird. Brains are weird. It happens. It's not a huge deal. It's not, we're not going to be like, oh, this guy fucking sucks. He can't use his dick. Yeah. Eventually, the guy's going to end up having a bad day on set. The worst thing that he can do is pitch a fucking fit about it. Mm-hmm. If a guy can just be honest and be like, hey, I'm sorry, it's just not working. I'm going to go ahead and call it so you can try to get somebody else. Or say, uh, I love it when a guy will stop and say, hey, what you're doing to my body is not really what is doing it for me right now. Can you switch it up? Like, lessen the hand grip or tug my balls harder like Mm -hmm. tell me what you need Mm -hmm. and communicate um and if you have a big ego and you just want to come in and be the big tough man that like fucks everybody into oblivion that's going to be really tough for you to do yeah um and then past that it's being able to be professional um you can't just so show up on set and expect your co-star or co-stars to just be available to you sexually um you can't just go and start trying to get them to suck your dick while you're there getting their makeup done. If they're doing pictures and stuff, you, you can't just like come up and grab them. You can't get to do every position that you want to do. Um, so even though this should be a fun and safe and comfortable job as much as possible, it, it's not about feeling good. It's, it's about It's performing. not about your pleasure. Yeah. Exactly. So expecting your scene partner, your coworker, to be your escort for the day is not professional. <laughs> Man, we're seeing a lot of discussions about that online of where the line is between enjoying what you're doing and using porn as a way to get laid. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really difficult because you want people to be excited to work with you. Like I, I want my co-stars to be attracted to me and be excited to put their penis inside of me. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> at the same time, like it, we're not on a date. Yeah. We're, I'm not your escort. So there, you can't come in with certain expectations you have to come in with the mindset of this is a job Mm -hmm. um and i feel like being able to do it physically um know how to be respectful know how to perform in a way that's not only great for your co-star but also for yourself a lot of guys especially in straight porn they don't want to do solo videos or cater to their male fans at all and i feel like that's kind of fumbling a bag Mm -hmm. um like most of the people who pay for porn are going to be men um both straight and queer yeah so if you're not comfortable doing any sort of fan service to them then that's your right i'm not saying that you should do it anyway even if you're uncomfortable but if you're cool with doing it you should probably do a couple of jerk-off videos, dude. Like, you should be able to build your own brand. A lot of dudes will get into amateur porn now, especially just thinking that they can just go and fuck a bunch of girls. But if you want to treat it as an actual job and make money off of it, what's going to be best is to create your own personal brand and your own personal fan base. So posting your own pictures, posting your own solo videos, making it so if people are coming to your page and they want to see porn, they're coming to look at your porn specifically, not all the girls that you're working with Mm -hmm. because cancellations happen, things fall through. Like it's, you're not always going to have a steady supply of women, but if they're a fan of who you are and you can post a solo, you can post a couple of selfies and they're just as happy as if you post a boy girl, that's going to be better for you than if you come into porn 
using it as a way to fuck porn stars and then you have a month where everyone's canceled last minute or you popped on your test and now you have no content to upload and all your fans are leaving you because they weren't there for you. They're there for all the girls you're trying to fuck. Yeah. Um, so that's like a whole new element with like the world of OnlyFans. Yeah, that that's up. true. And look, like, you know, you can tell yourself that it's women who are buying your content <laughs> and jerking off to your videos. I mean, whatever. Yeah. You know. And women watch porn too. Um, but when it comes to people who are paying for it, it's overwhelmingly men. Oh my God, overwhelmingly men. I mean, mm -hmm. even just this, my podcast alone, it's 96% male audience. Mm -hmm. People are always surprised by that because <laughs> I'm a woman. So they like think it's women. I'm like, no, mm -hmm. no. Very few women watch this show. Mm -hmm. So there you go, guys. I thought that was actually some really good insightful advice. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, okay, so my last question for you is what advice would you give to new performers? I'm thinking more women in this sense. Yeah. Um, definitely save your money as much as possible. Um, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to pay your taxes. You're going to make sure that you're going to have a rainy day fund. Um, sex work is wonderful and terrible in the sense that the money can be amazing or awful. Um, there are going to be times where there's a production hold because there's a HIV uh, positive test in the industry. So mm -hmm. nobody can get tested. Nobody can work for until they have a handle on the situation. Um, there are going to be times where people cancel last minute there's going to be times where you don't feel like working there's going to be times where you're going to need a mental or physical break maybe you got a tear maybe you're just going through a really terrible time mentally so if you don't have a nest egg and a cushion set up uh, it's just going to make those times even worse so that's like my number one thing like save your money when you're making it big you have to put a big chunk of that aside um other than that be very assertive about what you need um don't be afraid to tell people no don't be afraid to say no to working with certain creators. I, I think that without getting too much into it, there are some people that aren't the best to work with and some new people think that they have to work with them in order to have the success of some of the other stars that they've seen. Um, and I just wanna say that is not the case. There are a lot of different ways to be successful. You can be winning awards, you could be doing it big on Twitter, you could be making a bunch of money on OnlyFans, and uh, there's never one way to be successful. So if you see somebody doing it one particular way, don't think that you have to follow that exact same formula. You need to figure out what works for you um, to make yourself safe and happy. Um, I'm trying to think, I feel like there should be one more. <laughs> maybe I'm just rambling at this point. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's like so many, there's so much advice, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many things that, um, I feel like you could, you could write a whole book on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, learn about incubation periods for STDs. Cause there's so many people who don't know and that scares me. <laughs> um, so with most STDs like chlamydia, so syphilis, uh, gonorrhea, you can be exposed to it and it could be in your system but it's not going to be enough of a viral load to show up on a test immediately. Mm -hmm. For a lot of these STDs, it takes about a week to show up on a test. Um, and so I've run into situations before where I know I've been exposed. I think that maybe I have, it haven't happened, I think maybe it happened when I was supposed to be working with you at one point. Probably, possibly. <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of people have had to cancel because of mm -hmm. reasons like that. Yeah, it's right. not unusual. And I, if you have an exposure to an STD, um, you can't just say like, oh, well, I worked with the person that just popped positive on their test on Monday. Um, so now that it's Tuesday, I'm going to go ahead and get tested today, get my results on Wednesday. And if they're negative, I'm good. That's not how it works. You have mm. to take some time. Um, you have to take a break like about a week from when you were exposed to retest. Um, otherwise, you could get a false negative. Um, I would also learn about MGen. There's this new thing that, I guess it's not technically new, but it's been a, a new concern in the porn industry. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I could explain it better, but mm -hmm. the way it was explained to me was it can uh, cause really nasty uh, kidney infections and also affect your long-term reproductive health. So is this an STD? It, it's not exactly an STD. It's like a bacteria. Okay. Um, um, I might be completely butchering this. It's either a bacteria or a virus. I'm actually not entirely sure. Okay. Um, for somebody explained it to me in this way, where your body can naturally clear it on its own. Oh, mm -hmm. right. So it is uh, bacteria, so you can take antibiotics for it. Okay. Uh, but if you're taking antibiotics all the time, your body can build up a resistance to it. Yeah. So if you get uh, MGen, for instance, and instead of waiting out and seeing if your body can clear it on its own. You take the antibiotics, even though you're not having symptoms, just because you want to clear it as fast as possible and get back to work as fast as possible. By the time you eventually uh, get chlamydia, your body's going to have an even harder time getting rid of that because now it has a natural buildup against uh, antibiotics. So right. <laughs> that's a little scary. 
Um, I would definitely do a lot of research in all the different things that can happen to your body if you're sexually active um, with tearing, with STDs, with yeast infections, um, bacterial uh, vaginosis. Is that what it's called? I think oh, it's so, just called yeah. BV. So I was forgetting yeah, yeah, yeah. what it actually I stands think that's for. That's what it is. Um, and with uh, people with penises, I would say learn about the different ways that your body uh, can be better at holding an erection, have a bigger cum load. Um, don't jump right into Trimex, please. I feel like that's getting really popular lately. Uh, it's where people are shooting up their dicks in order to stay hard. Oh, wait, that's not Caverjack? Um, it could also be that. I've, I've okay. always heard it referred to as uh, Trimex. Okay. Um, I always hear it referred to as Caverjack. Mm, it's a shot Maybe in your it's, dick. Yeah, it's shot, <laughs> yeah. shot in your dick. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Um, and that can have long-term effects. Don't just jump into that. Um, it, it's it, Porn can be amazing, but you shouldn't have to kill your body in order to do it. So... I mean, ultimately, it's 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 hard on your body. Like any, I mean, I say that you guys are sexual athletes, and mm -hmm. I know that sometimes that's met with a little bit of like eyebrow raising, but like it's true. Yeah. Like you, I mean, you try to fucking shoot a forty-minute porn scene in a warehouse with no air conditioning, like reverse cowgirl, <laughs> reverse spit going down to your homeboy. Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> it's it's a lot, and it's it's hard on your body. You're right. Like it is it is hard on your body. So I think it is important to to understand that and that's why like i feel like sex workers are some of especially like the guys who have longevity or some of, like the healthiest people that you know yeah because they have to be really careful about how they treat their body mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely something you have to think about mm -hmm. so before we close this up i realized i didn't ask you like the one what i feel is a big important question your browser's contract. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> hello. Yeah. um because yeah. that was kind of you were a porn hub ambassador for a while but you only got recently signed as a browser's contract with like girl like a few months ago, right? Uh, a year ago now. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have no sense of time. <laughs> no, it's it's been amazing. I've worked with browsers for a long time, um, and they're one of my favorite companies to work for. Mm -hmm. um, and I was at this really weird point in my career right before I got contracted, where I was working a lot, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, working a lot means you're making good money, but I wanted to take a break, and I was afraid of turning down jobs because yeah. I didn't want people to think that I was going to be unavailable. Yeah. Um, so I was accepting everything and I was really grateful for the amount of work I was getting, but I kind of wanted to take a break, but I was afraid to ask for a break. Yeah. And so what a contract enabled me to do is now I'm shooting 30 scenes in every six months. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know about how often I'm going to have to be on a studio set. I can shoot my own stuff a lot easier. I can take breaks a lot easier. I'm about to go on vacations. So that's what yeah. it is. And I don't have to have that worry of like, oh, if I say no to too many people, they're going to think that I'm just like fading out of the industry mm -hmm. and not interested and they're going to stop calling me. Um, so that's been really great. And then I also get to work with some of the best directors and performers in the industry. Yeah. So that's fucking awesome. I, I won my first Best Leading Actress Award because yes. of the Digital Playground scene. Yes. Um, so being a Brazzers contract star, you're kind of able to work for all of the MindGeek-owned sites. So it's not just Brazzers. It's also Digital Playground, uh, Trans Angels, Twisties. Um, I know I'm forgetting a couple. Reality Kings. Reality Kings. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. It's yeah, a lot. it's a lot. They own a lot of brands. Mm -hmm. So I get to kind of travel throughout the Mind Geek Brazzers universe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. Um, I mean, obviously, I've worked for them for many years, and they're definitely, like, they're good people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're really, like, understanding, and they're really conscious of how they treat their contract stars. Oh, yeah. And um, they just, like, generally care about them, which is yeah. really lovely. No, they started doing the consent check-in videos um, before a lot of other vanilla sets. Oh, it used to yeah. be only a thing on um, kink sets. Yeah, no, I remember. Mm -hmm. I remember all those meetings oh, yeah. <laughs> where they were like, what are you doing as a director to, like, make <laughs> sure that your talent is happy? Mm -hmm. it was, yeah, it was pretty intense. Mm -hmm. They were very serious about it. And something else that I really love about them is um, – Back in 2020, in like the summer of 2020, when people are uh, going through a lot of George Floyd protests, Black Lives Matter protests, a lot of discussions about in the race, middle of COVID, in the middle yeah. of COVID, um, I feel like there are a couple of companies that were scrambling to make themselves seem less racist, and they had to change a lot of things mm -hmm. because they realized that a lot of their practices were not very fair to their non-white performers. 
browsers didn't have to change too much. Mm. And I think that that's kind of amazing. They yeah. were already just putting us in scenes. Like I, when I first started, all of my scenes were like interracial or ebony. This like the, the fact that I was black was the main focus of the scene. Yeah. Um, and browsers started putting me in scenes where they have their formulas, right? Like they have the, a scenario where a girl is cheating on her husband or a scenario where a girl wants to fuck the whole neighborhood and, mm-hmm. or is fucking in a bowling alley. And they have these like little storylines that they use over and over. And they're just plugging people in wherever. Like, if you're a hot girl, you get to be in the scene. It doesn't have to be the black scene. You know what I yeah. mean? Um, so they're already treating me the same as their white performers long before everyone else started scrambling to do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's pretty fucking amazing. The bar is in hell, but the, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we love you, Browser. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Kara, thank you so much for coming on. It's always a pleasure to see you. Um, if you're okay with it, we're going to do a couple of Patreon questions and like a separate separate yeah. separate segment after this just mm-hmm. a couple of minutes um but for now can you tell everybody where they can find you online yeah you can find me on twitter or tiktok at the kira noir you can find me on instagram at the kira noir gram and you can find me on OnlyFans at onlyfans.com slash the kira noir or the kira noir.com <laughs> fantastic and then you guys can find me on um instagram holly randall and also on Twitter or X as well. Basically, just go to hollylinks.com for links to all of my social media profiles. And uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you, Tushy, for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you, Tushy, for making my butthole clean and eatable. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that should be on a t-shirt. <laughs> thank you guys so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week.